Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Yes, today, our centennial. We spend the hour remembering Howard Zinn, the legendary historian, author, professor, playwright and activist. Howard Zinn was born 100 years ago, on August 24, 1922, to working-class Jewish immigrant parents in Brooklyn. He died in 2010 at the age of 87, but his books continue to be read across the globe. At 18 years old, Howard Zinn began working as a shipyard worker, then joined the Air Force, where he served as a bombardier in World War II. After witnessing the horrors of war, Howard Zinn went on to become a lifelong dissident and peace activist. He was active in the civil rights movement and other struggles for social justice. He taught at Spelman College in Atlanta, the historically black college for women. He was fired for insubordination for standing up for student protesters. While at Spelman, he served on the executive committee of SNCC—that's the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. After being forced out of Spelman, Zinn became a professor at Boston University. In 1967, he published Vietnam, The Logic of Withdrawal. It was the first book on the war to call for immediate withdrawal, no conditions. A year later, he and Father Dan Berrigan traveled to North Vietnam to receive the first three U.S. prisoners of war released by the North Vietnamese. When Dan Ellsberg needed a place to hide the Pentagon Papers before they were leaked to the press, he went to Howard Zinn and his late wife, Rosin. In 1980, Howard Zinn published his classic work, a People's History of the United States. The book would go on to sell over a million copies and change the way many look at history in America. We begin today's show with highlights from a production of Howard Zinn's Voices of People's History of the United States, where Howard Zinn introduces dramatic readings from history. We'll hear Alfre Woodard read the words of labor activist Mother Jones and Howard's son Jeffson read the words of an IWW poet and organizer, Arturo Giovannetti. But first, Howard Zinn. The IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, was a radical labor organization of the early 20th century. It organized all workers, black, white, men, women, native-born, foreign, skilled, unskilled, which the American Federation of Labor refused to do. Its goal was revolutionary, to take over the industrial system and run it for the benefit of the people. When immigrant women in the textile mills in Lawrence, Massachusetts, went on strike in 1912, they were met with police violence and judicial intimidation. The IWW poet and organizer, Arturo Giovannetti, was arrested on spurious charges for murder. Here is a speech to the jury which found him innocent. Mr. Foreman and gentlemen of the jury, it is the first time in my life that I speak publicly in your wonderful language and it is the most solemn moment in my life. There has been brought only one side of this great industrial question, only the method and only the tactics, but what about the ethical part of the question? What about the better and nobler humanity where there shall be no more slaves, where no man will ever be obliged to go on strike in order to obtain 50 cents a week more, where children will not have to starve anymore, where women no more will have to go and prostitute themselves, where at last there will not be any more slaves, any more masters, but just one great family of friends and brothers. They say you are free in this great and wonderful country. I say that Politically, you are, and my best compliments and congratulations. But I say you cannot be half free and half slave. And economically, all the working class in the United States are as much slaves now as the Negroes were 40 and 50 years ago. Because the man that owns the tool where another man works, the man that owns the house where this man lives, the man that owns the factory where this man wants to go to work, that man 
owns and controls the bread that that man eats and therefore owns and controls his mind, his body, his heart, and his soul. I am 29 years old, not quite. I, ha I have a woman that loves me and that I love. I have a mother and father that are waiting for me. I have an ideal that is dear to me that can be expressed or understood. And life has so many allurements, and it is so nice and so bright and so wonderful that I felt the passion of living in my heart, and I do want to live. Whichever way you judge, gentlemen of the jury, I thank you. In the year 1914, a thousand miners with wives and children who had gone on strike against the Rockefeller-owned coal mines in southern Colorado were holding out in a tent colony near the tiny hamlet of Ludlow. One day in April, the National Guard, financed by Rockefeller, began pouring machine gun fire into the tent colony and then came down from the hills and set fire to the tents. The next day, the bodies of 11 children and two women were found, suffocated, burned to death. This became known as the Ludlow Massacre. Mother Mary Jones, 82-year-old organizer for the mine workers, had come to Colorado to support the miners. And on the eve of their strike, as they gathered in the opera house in Trinidad, she spoke to them. What would the coal in the mines be worth if you did not work to take it out? The time is ripe for you to stand like men. I know something about strikes. I didn't go into them yesterday. I was carried 84 miles and landed in jail by a United States Marshal in the night because I was talking to a miners' meeting. The next morning, I was brought to court, and the judge said to me, did you read my injunction? Did you understand that the injunction told you not to look at the miners? As long as the judge who is higher than you leaves me sight, I will look at anything I want to, said I. The old judge died soon after that, and the injunction died with him. At another time when in the courtroom, the bailiff said to me, when you are addressing the court, you must say your honor. I don't know whether he has any or not, said I. <laughs> Someone said to me, you don't believe in charity work, mother? No, I don't believe in charity. It is a vice. We need the upbuilding of justice to mankind. We don't need your charity. All we need is an opportunity to live like men and women in this country. I want you to pledge yourselves in this convention to stand as one solid army against the foes of human labor. Think of the thousands who are killed every day and there is no redress for it. We will fight until the mines are made secure and human life valued more than props. Look things in the face. Don't fear a governor. Don't fear anybody. You pay the governor. He has a right to protect you. You are the biggest part of this population, the biggest part of the population in this state. You create its wealth. So I say, let the fight go on. If anybody else, nobody else will keep on. I will. That was Alfre Woodard reading the words of labor activist Mother Jones as part of a live reading of Howard Zinn's Voices of a People's History of the United States, as we continue with our Zentennial, celebrating the life and legacy of the late Howard Zinn, born 100 years ago, in 1922. Howard Zinn was a regular guest on Democracy Now! from the time we went on the air in 1996 up until his death. In 2005, he joined us in our Firehouse studio at DCTV, downtown community television in Lower Manhattan. It is great to have you with us. Well, it's nice of you to invite me. I was worried. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just came from Bedford Hills Correctional Facility? Well, actually, uh, yesterday afternoon I spoke at uh, Bedford Hills euphemistically called correctional facility. They don't hardly correct anything, but spoke to prisoners there, women pr prisoners, mostly prisoners of color, and spoke to them yesterday afternoon before I gave this talk last night at Manhattanville College. And what did you talk about with the women? 
Well, I, they had been using my book. They, they, had, they have classes. They're using my book, A People's History of the United States. Uh, they wanted, and I talked to them about history, about doing history, about why I did history the way I did, <laughs> why I did, you know, unneutral history, why I, and uh, how I came to do it. And I told them something about my life, and of course, I always like to talk about that, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, uh, and then they asked a lot of questions. A very lively, enthusiastic, excited group. I mean, if every teacher in the country had a class like that, you know, they would be inspired. And it's wonderful, and I've always found this to be true, wonderful and always amazing when you talk to prisoners uh, who should be the last ones to be up and optimistic and in good spirits, but uh, it's always there. Uh, it, it, it's actually encouraging, uh, you know, and, of course, troubling to know that these people, these remarkable people, are being kept in prison, you know, very often, most of the time, for nonviolent crimes, and kept there for long periods of time. It's sort of sad commentary on American society that we have people in Washington <laughs> who are free, <laughs> and these people are in prison. You talked about being a teacher, but... Howard's in the places you were uh, where you did teach. Well, Spelman, you were fired, and Boston University, you were almost fired. Oh, are you trying to make me out as a troublemaker? <laughs> what happened to you at Spelman? Well, at Spelman, I, I got involved with my students in the, the, the actions that were going on in the South, the sit-ins, the demonstrations, the picket lines. I was supporting my students, and and. Uh, uh, this is the first black president of Spelman College, a very conservative institution. Uh, he wasn't happy about me joining the students in all of these things. He wasn't happy about a lot of things that they did, but he couldn't do anything about it. But when I, the students came back from, you might say, from jail and then rebelled against the campus regulations and the restrictions on them, and I supported them. During that the was civil rights years. This is, yeah, these were during the civil rights years. And, and, uh, and so... You know, he was very unhappy with the fact that I was supporting the students who were rebelling against the paternalism and the authoritarianism on that campus. They were uh, women students. Yeah, these were black women students, and and uh, and you know, the the movement brought them out of this little sort of uh, convent-like atmosphere of Spelman College and out into the world. The author, Alice Walker, was one of those students? Yeah, Alice Walker was one of my students. Marion Wright Edelman, the head of the Children's Defense Fund now in Washington, she was one of my students. I'm very proud of, the, of those students I had at Spelman. Um, and, uh, yeah, Marion, Marion Wright Edelman was in jail, and Alice Walker was in jail, and... Um, yeah, it was a great moment. Now, Boston University was many years later. Why did you almost get thrown out of there? Why did I almost get thrown out of Boston University? We had a strike. Faculty went on strike. Secretaries went on strike. They settled with the faculty after what was a successful strike, but not with the secretaries. And so I and some other faculty refused to cross the secretary's picket line. And, uh, th and five of us who refused to do that uh, were threatened with firing, even though all of us had tenure. And so it was a long struggle, but we won. Going back before both of your uh, tenures as professor, you were a bombardier in World War II. Mm, that's true, yes. And yeah. you talk about your final bombing run, mm. not over Japan, not over Germany, mm. but over France. Yeah, well... Um, we thought the bombing missions were over. The war was about to come to an end. This was in April of 1945. You may remember the war ended in early May 1945. This was a few weeks before the war was going to be over, and everybody knew it was going to be over, and our armies were past France into Germany, but there was a little pocket of German soldiers hanging around this little town of Royan on the Atlantic coast of France, and the Air Force decided to bomb them. 1,200 heavy bombers, uh, and I was in one of them, uh, flew over this little town of Royan and dropped napalm, first use of napalm in the European theater. Uh, and we don't know how many people we killed or how many people were terribly burned as a result of what we did, but uh, I did it 
like most soldiers do, unthinkingly, uh, mechanically, thinking we're on the right side, they're on the wrong side, and therefore we can do whatever we want and it's okay. And only afterward, only really after the war, that I, when I was reading about Hiroshima from John Hersey and reading the stories of the survivors of Hiroshima and what they went through, only then did I begin to think about the human effects of bombing. Only then did I begin to think about what it meant to human beings on the ground when bombs were dropped on them. Because as a bombardier, you know, I was flying at 30,000 feet, six miles high, couldn't hear screams, couldn't see blood. and. This is modern warfare. In modern warfare, you soldiers fire, they drop bombs, and they, they're, they have no notion, really, of what is happening to the human beings that they're firing on. Everything is done at a distance. This enables terrible atrocities to take place. And I think, uh, reflecting back on that bombing raid, uh, and thinking of that in Hiroshima and all the other raids on civilian cities and the killing of huge numbers of civilians in German and Japanese cities, the killing of 100,000 people in Tokyo in one night of firebombing, all of that made me realize war, uh, even so-called good wars against fascism like World War II, wars don't solve any fundamental problems and they always poison everybody on both sides. They poison the minds and souls of everybody on both sides. We're seeing that now in Iraq, where the minds of our soldiers are being poisoned by being an occupying army in a land where they are not wanted. And the results are terrible. You learned you dropped napalm on this French village? Well, we didn't, we had, actually didn't know what it was. They said, oh, you're not going to have the usual 500-pound demolition bombs. Uh, you're going to carry one, you're going to carry 30 100-pound canisters of jellied gasoline. We had no idea what that was, but it was napalm. You went to that village later? Uh, later, I went, yeah, later I visited that village about 10 years after the war. I went, and I went to the, uh, the library which had been destroyed and which was now rebuilt. And I dug out uh, records of what the survivors and what they had written about the bombing. And, and I, I wrote, an, uh, I wrote a, a kind of essay of, about the bombing of Royan, uh, which appears, uh, where does it appear? <laughs> it appears in my book, the, the Zen Reader, and also in my book, The Politics of History. Uh, but it was, uh, um, for me, it was a very important experience. A very a great uh, sobering lesson about so-called good wars. You learned when you were there on the ground many years later who had died. Well, I you know I spoke to people who who had survived that and who, who whose family members had died, and they were very bitter uh, about uh, the bombing, and uh, you know they tr attributed it to all sorts of things, the desire to try out a new weapon. It's amazing how many things are done in war just to try out new weapons. You know, maybe the, the one of the reasons for dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was to see what this does to human beings. Human beings become uh, sacrifices in the desire to develop new uh, military technology. And I think that was one of those instances. We're talking to historian Howard Zinn here in our firehouse studio in Chinatown, just blocks from where the towers of the World Trade Center once stood. You went to Vietnam, to North Vietnam, with Dan Berrigan? Yeah, yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> well, uh, this was early 1968. This was the time of the Tet Offensive, also the time of the Tet Holiday, uh, the, the Vietnamese holiday. And the North Vietnamese decided they wanted to release the first three airmen, prisoners, uh, who had been shot down uh, over North Vietnam, and they wanted to release them in the custody of not the American government, but the peace movement. So Daniel Berrigan, poet, priest, whom I had never met before, he and I traveled together to Hanoi, to North Vietnam, to pick up these three uh, American airmen uh, who were being released by the North Vietnamese. And then we spent uh, some time in Hanoi and in the surrounding area, visited bombed out areas, visited little villages that had been uh, jet bombed in the middle of the night, a million miles from any possible military target. Uh, and, and that 
We, we, we were being bombed, Vietnam was being bombed every night. Every day we were going into air raid shelters. Uh, every night Daniel Berrigan would write a poem about what had happened uh, that day. Um, and, uh, no. Um, what do you say to those then and now, um, b before the invasion, who would go to Iraq, those who went to North Vietnam, when they would be called traitors, giving comfort to the enemy? You mean Americans who went to North Vietnam? You mean like Jane Fonda and so many others who went to North Vietnam? And Iraq before. I mean, even and people like Congress Member McDermott of Seattle, oh, people reporters gone, saying people that they should People have gone to Iraq. And, I mean, what about, you know, there's people and voices in the wilderness, Americans who went to Iraq and violating the U.S. Uh, sanctions and bringing food and medicine, you know, and the whole business of being traitors. You know, I think there's a whole, there's a somehow some wrong-headed notion of what treason is and what patriotism is, and there's some notion that if you disobey the orders of your government or the laws of your government, you're being treasonous. But I believe the government is being treasonous and the government is being unpatriotic when the government violates the fundamental rights of human beings. When the government invades another country, uh, a country that has not attacked it, a country that has not in, uh, threatened it, when our government invades another country and, and drops bombs and kills huge numbers of people, and then Americans have the the, the guts to go to that country and bring people food and medicine or go to see what is going on, as many Americans did when they went to Vietnam. Uh, I think these are the most patriotic Americans. And, you know, if you define patriotism as obedience to the government, then you, you uh, I think, following a kind of totalitarian principle, because that's the principle of a totalitarian state, that uh, you, f you do what the government tells you to do. And democracy means that the government is a, an instrument of the people, and that this is the Declaration of Independence. Governments are artificial entities set up in order to preserve the rights, equal right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness of people. When the government violates those rights, it is the duty of people to defy that government. That is patriotism. Howardson, you called your autobiography, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. Why? Well, uh, it came from, uh, I stole it from myself. That is, I used to say that to my classes at the beginning of every class. I, did, I, w I wanted to be honest with them about the fact that they were not entering a class where the teacher would be neutral. It was not going to be a class where, you know, the teacher spent a half a year with a, or a year with the students and they hadn't, would have no idea where the teacher stood on the important issues. This is not going to be a neutral class, I said. I don't believe in neutrality. I believe neutrality is impossible because the world is already moving in certain directions. Wars are going on. Children are starving. And to be neutral, to pretend to neutrality, to not take a stand in a situation like that is to collaborate with whatever's going on, to allow it to happen. I did not want to be a collaborator with what was happening. I wanted to, to enter into history. I wanted to play a role. I wanted my students to play a role. I wanted us to intercede. I wanted my history uh, to intercede. Uh, and to take a stand on behalf of peace, on behalf of, of the, a racial equality or sexual equality. Uh, and uh, so I wanted my students to know that right from the beginning. No, uh, you can't be neutral on a moving train. Were you surprised by the election of President Bush, November 2004? Um, a little. <laughs> a little. Uh, that is... Uh, I thought that maybe by then, uh, perhaps there would be enough understanding about the deception, the hypocrisy of the U.S. government, just in enough uh, to dethrone Bush. But I say only a little surprised, because on the other hand, I, I knew that John Kerry was not the candidate to represent the feelings of the American people. By then, by the time of the election, at least half of the American people were already against the war. And now they faced an election where 100% of the candidates were for the war. And so they had nobody to vote for. And, uh, and so I, I, um, with nobody to vote for, with no real alternative, 
Uh, of course, 40 percent of the pop voting population did not vote. And people ought to remember this, you know, Bush did not win overwhelmingly. Uh, you know, he won by one or two percentage points, and if you consider how many people voted for him against the voting population, you know, he got, you know, maybe 30 percent of the voting population. But uh, it, w it was a commentary on the, the pitiful showing of the Democratic Party, uh, its failure to be a true opposition party in this country, and I think maybe a wake-up call to Americans to try to create a new political alternative to a political system that is really a one-party system and that is quite corrupt. Professor Howard Zinn in our Firehouse studio in 2005. The legendary historian, writer, professor, playwright and activist was born 100 years ago, in 1922. On October 21, 2001, Howard Zinn gave a major address at the University of Vermont in Burlington. It was just over a month after the 9-11 attacks and two weeks after the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, beginning what became the longest war in U.S. history. U.S. troops remained until August 2021. Today, the Taliban are back in power. This is Howard Zinn in 2001. If you think we're, you know, what we're doing in, in, in Afghanistan is, you know, it's not very much, you know. Uh, consider that there are hundreds of thousands of people in Afghanistan who are fleeing the cities and towns in which they live. Have you seen the pictures of Afghan refugees? It started as soon as Bush promised to bomb, because there are certain American promises they can count on, you see. And that's one of them. Uh, and the, the refugees immediately uh, began moving. And, and so you see the pictures of, of, of these families with all their possessions, or as many of their possessions they carry on their backs and their wagons and their kids, and, uh, and hundreds of thousands of them. So, so this isn't a small thing. This isn't just, oh, we're killing a few people and that's a price we're willing to pay. We are terrorizing Afghanistan. I'm not exaggerating. The people, who are, the people who are in Kabul, the people who are in Kabul, the people who are in Kabul and people in other places in Afghanistan have to live with the fear of these bombs. Have you lived under bombs? Do you know what it is? Can you imagine what it's like? And you, you're in a very backward, technologically, right? undeveloped country, and there are these monster machines coming over with this ferocious noise and the lights and the flashing and the explosions. And it's, yes, we're terrorizing people in Afghanistan. And it's not, it's not right to respond to the fact that we have been terrorized, as we have, not right to respond to that by terrorizing other people. Absolutely wrong, you see. You know. You know. And, and furthermore, <laughs> it's not going to help. <laughs> I mean, you say, well, maybe it may be worth doing because this will end terrorism. I mean, how much common sense does it take to know that you, can, you, you cannot end terrorism by indiscriminately just throwing bombs on Afghanistan? And, and then, of course, you hear the reports, we have, we have now destroyed three of their camps, so we've destroyed four. Who are you kidding? How many hours does it take to set up a training camp? How easy it is to move from one place to another? I mean, the history of bombing is mostly a history of futility. Yes, really. You know, there's a book that came out recently called A History of Bombing. <laughs> and the history of bombing, oh, and you know, I, I was a bombardier. And, uh, and, and sure, the technology has improved, although it was claimed even then, it was claimed our bombs are smart because we're using the special bomb site, this Norden bomb site. People really believe that. Even we believe that, we who are using the bomb site. 
because we would bomb at 11,000 feet or 4,000 feet, and we got pretty close to the target. But then when we flew on missions, we were bombing at 30,000 feet, and the bombs went all over the place <laughs> and killed an awful lot of people, all sorts of people, you know, it didn't matter. I say it didn't matter because these people were ciphers. Who are these people? I didn't even see them. You bomb, you bomb another country, you don't see these people. You're bombing from high altitudes. You know, our planes are bombing at high altitudes because they want to escape anti-aircraft fire, right? No, you don't see anything on the ground. You see flashes and you see explosions and you may take pictures, but you don't, you don't hear screams, you don't see blood, you don't see severed limbs, you don't see any of that. We saw that in New York. We saw those scenes in New York. They horrified us. We, we saw people in panic running, running from that, those explosions, that enormous pile of debris, you know, and, and we were horrified. These were real people to us. But then, if we bomb other countries, those people are not real to us. One of the things I thought of after I got over my initial horror at what happened in New York, I thought, hey, that's what it must have been like when I was bombing in Europe. That's what it must have been like, and I didn't even know it, because these people were ciphers to me, you see. And then I thought, maybe to these terrorists, that's what it is for them. Oh, 6,000 human beings. You know, no, they have a mission, they have a goal, no. Uh, they're, not, they're not human beings to terrorists. And people in other parts of the world have not been human beings to us. And if there's anything we might get out of this experience, is that we might take that horror that we have felt looking at those scenes in New York and the compassion that we have felt for the people who endured this and their families and extend this to people in other parts of the world who have been enduring this, enduring this for a very long time. You know. And that does mean, that does mean examining the United States and our policies. You know, if, if you, because, you know, when you do that, when you suggest that, say, you know, I think maybe we ought to look at ourselves and our policies. There's people say, oh, you're justifying what happened. No, no, absolutely not. To explain is not to justify. But if you don't want to explain anything, you will never learn anything. So you have to, ex have to understand. You have to explain without justifying. And you have to look, yes, you have to dig down and see if you can figure out what is at the root of this terrorism. Because there is something at the root besides, you know, uh, irrational, uh, murderous feeling. And, and yes, this was murderous, fanatical feeling. But, but these were not simply madmen who just, you know, there are people like who just go berserk and kill everybody in sight, right? We know that because, you know, we've had seen that in our country. You know, somebody just, you know, something goes haywire in them and they just go wild and they, no, it's not. It's not that, terrorism is not that sort of thing. It's there, there's something underneath uh, that, in, you know, that fanaticism which may have a core of truth to it. That is, there's something in the core of belief of these terrorists which may also be at the core of belief of millions of other people in the world who are not terrorists who are angry at American policy, but who are not fanatic enough to go and kill Americans because they're angry at our policy, but who are capable of doing that if they are even more aroused 
And even if, if we begin even doing more things to anger them, there's an, you might say, there's a reservoir of possible terrorists among all those people in the world who have suffered as a result of U.S. foreign policy. Now, I don't know if you think I'm exaggerating when I say there are millions of people in the world who have suffered as a result of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, but yes, there are. And Bush, at a recent press conference, said something like, I don't understand why these people hate us. <laughs> no, I don't, I, you know, said, we are good. That's what he said. We are good. You know, look at me. I'm good. You know. Well, sometimes the United States is good. Yes. There are a lot of good things about the United States. And yes, there are times when the United States is good. And then there are times, unfortunately, many times, too many times, when the United States has been bad. Uh, evil, really, and has carried out policies that have resulted in the deaths of, yes, millions of people. Howardson, speaking in October 2001, just two weeks after the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, as we continue to remember the legendary historian Howard Zinn a hundred years after his birth in 1922. In 2006, we featured a speech Professor Zinn delivered in Madison, Wisconsin, as he received the Haven Center's Award for Lifetime Contribution to Critical Scholarship. His lecture was titled, The Uses of History and the War on Terrorism. I was talking to my barber the other day, because we always discuss world politics, and he's totally pr politically unpredictable, uh, as most barbers are. <laughs> uh, he, said, he said, Howard, he said, um, you know, you and I disagree on many things, but on one thing we agree, war solves nothing. And I thought, yeah, it's not hard for people to grasp that. And there again, history is useful. We've had a history of war after war after war after war. What have they solved? What have they done? Even World War II, the good war, the war in which I volunteered, the war in which I dropped bombs, the war after which, you know, I, you know, I received a letter from General Marshall, General of Generals, a letter addressed personally to me and to 16 million others, uh, in which he said, we've won the war, it will be a new world. Well, of course, it wasn't a new world. It hasn't been a new world. War after war after war. There's certain, I came out of that war, the war in which I volunteered, the war in which I was an enthusiastic bombardier, I came out of that war with certain I, ideas which just developed gradually at the end of the war, ideas about war. One that war corrupts everybody who engages in it. War poisons everybody who engages in it. Uh, you start off as the good guys, as we did in World War II. They're the bad guys, they're the fascists. What could be worse? Uh, so they're the bad guys, we're the good guys. And as the war goes on, the good guys begin behaving like the bad guys. You can trace this back to the, the Peloponnesian War. You can trace it back to the good guy, the Athenians, and the bad guys, the Spartans. And after a while, the Athenians become ruthless and cruel like the Spartans. And we did that in World War II. We, after Hitler committed his atrocities, we committed our atrocities. Uh, now, our killing of 600,000 civilians in Japan, our killing of uh, probably an equal number of civilians in Germany, these, they weren't Hitler, they weren't Toja, they weren't, no, they were just ordinary people, like, like we are ordinary people uh, with a, living in a country that is a marauding country, and they were living in countries that were marauding countries, and they were, they were caught up in, in whatever it was, and afraid to speak up. Uh, and, I don't know, I came to the conclusion, yes, war poisons everybody, and war, uh, this is an important thing to keep in mind. 
that when you go to war against a tyrant, and this was one of the claims, oh, we're going to get rid of Saddam Hussein, which was, was cost nonsense. They didn't. <laughs> did our government care that Saddam Hussein who tyrannized his own people? We helped him tyrannize his people. We helped him gas the Kurds. We helped him accumulate weapons of mass destruction, really. Uh, and, uh, but when you go to war against a tyrant, the people you kill in the war are the victims of the tyrant. The people we killed in Germany were the victims of Hitler. The people we killed in Japan were the victims of the Japan Imperial Army. You know. and, uh, and the people who die in wars are more and more and more people who are not in the military. You, you may know this about the different ratio of civilian to military deaths in war, how in World War I, 10 military dead for one civilian dead. In World War II, it was 50-50, half military, half civilian. In Vietnam, it was 70% civilian and 30% military. And in the war since then, it's 80% and 85% civilian. Uh, uh, I became friends a few years ago with an Italian war surgeon named Gino Strada, who wrote a Spent, he spent 10 years, 15 years, doing surgery on war victims all over the world. And he wrote a book about it, Green Parrots, Diary of a War Surgeon. He said, in all the patients that he operated on in Iraq and Afghanistan and everywhere, 85% of them were civilians, one-third of them children. If you understand and if people understand, and if you spread the word of this understanding, that whatever is told to you about war and how, in, how we must go to war and whatever the threat is or whatever the goal is, democracy or liberty, it will always be a war against children. They're the ones who will die in large numbers. The so war, well, Einstein said this after World War I, he said, war cannot be humanized, it can only be abolished. War has to be abolished, you know. And uh, it's, uh, I, know, I know, I know it's a long shot. <laughs> I understand that. But you have to, when something is a long shot, but it has to be done, you have to start doing it. Just as the ending of slavery in this country in the 1830s was a really long shot, but people stuck at it, and it took 30 years that slavery was done away with, and uh, we can see this again and again. So uh, we, have a, we have a job to do. We have lots of things to do. Uh, one of the things we can learn from history is that history is not only a history of things inflicted on us by the powers that be. History is also a history of resistance. It's a history of, of people uh, who endure tyranny for decades, uh, but who ultimately rise up and overthrow the dictator. We've seen this in country after country, surprise after surprise. Rulers who seem to have total control, they suddenly wake up one day and there are uh, a million people in the streets and they pack up and leave. Uh, they, uh, we, this has happened in the Philippines and, the, uh, and uh, in Yemen. <laughs> in uh, all over, in uh, uh, Nepal. M million people in the streets, and then the, ru the ruler has to get out of the way. Uh, so uh, this is what we're aiming for uh, in this country. Uh, everything we do is important. Every little thing we do, every, every picket line we walk on, every letter we write, every act of civil disobedience we engage in, uh, any r recruiter that we talk to, any parent that we talk to, any GI that we talk to, any young person that we talk to, uh, anything we do in class, outside of class, everything we do in the direction of a different world uh, is uh, important, uh, even though at the moment they seem futile, uh, because that's how change comes about. Change comes about when millions of people do little things which at certain points in history come together and then uh, something good and something important happens. Thank you. Legendary historian Howard Zinn, speaking in 2006.
Well, three years later, in May of 2009, just a year before he died, Professor Zinn joined us in the Democracy Now! studio as he launched the paperback edition of A Young People's History of the United States. I asked him if he thought his retelling of history about Columbus and other traditional heroes was suitable for children. It's true that people have asked that question again and again. Now, should we tell uh, kids uh, that Columbus, whom they have been told was a great hero, that uh, Columbus mutilated Indians and kidnapped them and killed them uh, in pursuit of gold? Should we tell people that uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who is held up as one of our great presidents, was really a, a warmonger who loved military exploits and who congratulated an American general who committed a massacre in the Philippines. Should we tell young people that? And I think the answer is we should be honest with young people. We should not deceive them. Uh, we should be honest about the history of our country, and uh, we should be not only taking down the traditional heroes like Andrew Jackson, Theodore Roosevelt, but we should be giving young people an alternate set of heroes. Instead of Theodore Roosevelt, tell them about Mark Twain. Mark Twain, well, Mark Twain everybody learns about as the author of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. But when we go to school, we don't learn about Mark Twain as the vice president of the Anti-Imperialist League. We aren't told that Mark Twain denounced Theodore Roosevelt for approving this massacre of the Philippines. You know, we want to give uh, young people uh, ideal figures like Helen Keller. And I remember learning about Helen Keller. Everybody learns about Helen Keller, you know, a disabled person who overcame her handicaps and became famous. But people don't learn in school, and young people don't learn in school what we want them to learn when we do books like A Young People's History of the United States, that Helen Keller was a socialist. She was a, a labor organizer. She refused to cross a picket line that was picketing a theater showing a play about her. And so there are these, these alternate heroes in American history. There's Fannie Lou Hamer and Bob Moses. They're the heroes of the Civil Rights Movement. There are a lot of people who are obscure, who are not known. We have in this young people's history, we have a, uh, a young hero uh, who um, was sitting on the bus in, refu in Montgomery, Alabama, refused to leave the front of the bus. And it was before Rosa Parks. I mean, Rosa Parks is justifiably famous for refusing to uh, leave her seat, and she got arrested, and that was the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott, and really the beginning of a great movement in the South. But we, uh, this 15-year-old girl did it first. And so we, we have a lot of it. We are trying to bring a lot of these obscure people uh, back uh, into the forefront of uh, our attention and, and inspire young people to say, this is the way to live. Howard Zinn in the Democracy Now! studio in 2009, as he launched the paperback edition of A Young People's History of the United States. He died unexpectedly the next year, in January of 2010. We end today's show with one of Howard Zinn's last public appearances. He spoke in November 2009 at Boston University. When I was discharged from the Army, from the Air Force, I got a letter from General Marshall. He was a general of generals. He was sending a letter, uh, not a personal letter to me. <laughs> uh, dear Howie. No. <laughs> a letter that was sent to 16 million men who had served in the armed forces, some women too. <laughs> uh, and uh, the letter was something like this. We've won the war. Congratulations for your service. It will be a new world. It wasn't a new world. And we know it hasn't been a new world since World War II. War after war after war after war, and 50 million people were dead in that war to end all wars, to end fascism and dictatorship and militarism. Oh, so, yes, I, 
came to the conclusion that war cannot be tolerated, no matter, no matter what we're told. And if we think that there are good wars, and that therefore, well, maybe this is a good war, I wanted to examine the so-called good wars, the holy wars, and, uh, yeah, and take a good look at them and think again about the phenomenon of war and come to the conclusion, well, yes, war cannot be tolerated. No matter what we're told, no matter what tyrant exists, what border has been crossed, what aggression has taken place, it's not that we're going to be, we're going to be passive in the face of tyranny or, or aggression, no. But we'll find ways other than war to deal with whatever problems we have. Because war is inevitably, inevitably, the indiscriminate, massive killing of huge numbers of people and children are a good part of those people. Every war is a war against children. Uh, so it's not just getting rid of <laughs> Saddam Hussein. Think about it. Well, we got rid of Saddam Hussein. In the course of it, we killed huge numbers of people who had been victims of Saddam Hussein. When you fight a war against a tyrant, who do you kill? You kill the victims of the tyrant. Anyway, all this, all this was simply to make us think again about war and, and to think, you know, we, we're, we're at war now, <laughs> right? In Iraq, in Afghanistan, and sort of in Pakistan, since we're sending rockets over there and killing innocent people in Pakistan. And uh, so we should not accept that. Uh, we should look for, an, look for a, a peace movement to join. Really, look for some peace organization to join. Uh, I mean, it will look small at first and pitiful and helpless, but that's how movements start. That's how the movement against the Vietnam War started. Started with handfuls of people who thought they were helpless, thought they were powerless. But remember this, the power of the people on top depends on the obedience of the people below. When people stop obeying, they have no power. Now, when workers go on strike, huge corporations lose their power. When consumers boycott, huge business establishments uh, have to give in. When soldiers refuse to fight, as so many soldiers did in Vietnam, so many deserters, so many fraggings, acts of violence by enlisted men against officers in Vietnam. B-52 pilots refusing to fly bombing missions anymore. War can't go on. When enough soldiers refuse, uh, the government has to has to decide we can continue. So yes, uh, people have the power if they begin to organize, if they protest, if to create a strong enough movement, uh, they can change things. That's all I want to say. Historian Howard Zinn speaking in 2009, just months before his death. Northwestern professor Kianga Yamato-Taylor has written, We need Howard Zinn now more than ever, not for the sake of romance or to construct another hero in history. We need his insights, his politics, and his commitment to the struggle for a better world. And that does it for our Zentennial, celebrating the historian Howard Zinn, born 100 years ago in 1922. Special thanks to Mike Burke, Neil Shibata, and Brendan Allen. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Nina Guzder, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Tarina Nadura, Sam Alcoff, Tay Marie Astudio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, and Mary Conlon. Our executive director is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, John Randolph, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Hugh Grant, Dennis Moynihan, David Prude, and Dennis McCormick. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.